Hello, I'm the Angry Spork. A couple of weeks ago, I looked at Convergence, the new Teen Titans, and mentioned that I hadn't really intended to buy it. Today, I'm taking issue with the title I did plan on buying the whole time. Convergence, the Titans. The mix-up is kind of understandable when you think about it. Scripted by Fabian Nisiza, with art from Ron Wagner, Jose Marzan Jr., and Chris Sotomayor, Let's check out another version of the Titans and see if this story makes us want to turn the page or turn our heads. The first cover features all the characters facing the reader with happy expressions. The older versions of Donna Troy and Starfire than we saw in the previous Titans story, and Arsenal slash Red Arrow slash Roy Harper holding his daughter Leanne. More on that craziness in a bit. A splash page has Roy narrating on his time as Speedy amongst the original Teen Titans. Robin, Wonder Girl, Kid Flash, and Aqualad, each a sidekick to better known heroes. From there it goes into a succinct overview of his life as he grew up, including his heroin addiction, recovery, hero name change to Arsenal, becoming a single father, and losing an arm, then his daughter. Both of those losses happened in the same story, James Robinson's Cry for Justice. Frankly, I think killing off a small child was really going overboard and felt needlessly cruel. Also note, the title of this issue is Try for Justice, in a not-so-subtle hint, I'm sure. I also noticed that Roy's memory seems to show him seeing Leanne being crushed by debris, though in Robinson's original story she died off-panel and was discovered by Green Arrow and her death was relayed to him through communication. Though that happened in the same pre-Flashpoint continuity as a bunch of other tie-ins here, so perhaps this is an alternate reality that's just strikingly similar, but a little different. While not blaming himself for Leanne's death, Roy knows he can let it ruin or improve his life. He chose the former up until the dome covered Gotham, causing panic for the first few weeks, but things improved, despite Metas losing their powers. And so did anyone with cybernetic limbs? What? In the other Titans comic I reviewed, Cyborg was getting along fine. I mean, the casing for his power supply was faltering, but he could still, you know, move. So I don't know what's up. Either Nasiza was misinformed about the finer details of Convergence's gimmick, or Marv Wolfman was. Eventually, Roy did better too. No anxiety from brawling metas and a city needing to share led to less crime, and he set up a shelter he named Leanne's Place. As he impresses some kids with his simple prosthetic arm, the dome fades and we get Telos' message, though with a few differences from previous tie-ins. He calls Donna Troy at her photo studio while she's in a shoot with Starfire, and the women see they're no longer on Earth, and their powers have returned. Troy in particular feels whole again, though having initially seen her power loss as a blessing. They'll find out the hows and whys of this sudden development after a few more seconds of joyous flight. I've been able to fly. Only my dreams. Why must I wake up in a world full of liars, cheats, and destroyers of my favorite characters? Oh. Ow! Well, Roy's going to do a sweep of the city and suggest they suit up in case of trouble, and he and Donna have a playful back and forth about her previous outfits which I imagine they can do since they've been friends for so long. He enters a secret lair he set up with some of the Wayne Foundation grant money for displaced families. The money that didn't go into the shelter, of course. He activates all eyes, which gives him access to cameras across the city, and no sooner does he sit down than a security alert sounds from Port Adams. With the likes of the Justice League MIA, it's up to any hero in the city to face whatever he sends Donna and Corey after. They tell him of the voice they heard while putting on their battle togs, about the impending battle and the one city surviving, though that seems a bit confusing, given that at least part of that was seen announced before Roy even called them, and they were in civilian clothes. Unless part of Talos' experiment is to mix up his speech a little, 
or each pair of battling realities, I think the editors missed a little detail there. Coriander, however, is glad to be able to fly and fight again, so all's good with her as they arrive at the chaotic port to find a group called the Extremists, consisting of Gorgon, Lord Havoc, Die Hard, Dream Slayer, and Tracer. They conquered an alternate Earth and have even fought the Justice League, meaning they're far from pushovers. Knowing his friends will need help, Roy attaches his now functional arm and reminds himself what he does, he does to bring meaning to losing Luann. Losing sight of that risks changing who he is and why he fights. He arrives in time to free the women from the grip of a would-be Dr. Octopus, and the two uneven sides ready to square off again. However, Dream Slayer figures it'd be better if Arsenal kills his fellow Titans instead, as the Archer raises a twin-barreled cannon from his forearm. In exchange, he would see the return of his daughter, now encased in an energy bubble by the villain, explaining his power to take her away from the moment of her untimely death, assuring this is no illusion. He can either kill his friends and have his child, or they'll all die anyway. Roy struggles seeing his scared little girl trapped. Each barrel of his weapon suddenly turns to his friends, and on the final page, they simultaneously fire point-blank. What Roy forgot was that in the time of moderate peace, he loaded his arm weapons with paintballs. Maintaining the tradition, the issue has two pages of history on the character, including garish details of Cry for Justice, as well as his subsequent return to addiction. Stay classy, DC. Issue number two's cover, however, would appear to spoil that Troy and Star are just fine, the latter apparently doing a Dr. Strange impersonation while they join Arsenal in attacking Dream Slayer. His cyber arm modified to a different weapon and while shaking his fist indignantly. And instead of just being an ambiguous glowing head, the villain looks like he has a bird head that's on fire. The immediate aftermath of the previous cliffhanger would make it appear that he somehow missed. The choice was, my daughter could live again if I killed my best friends. As if. Like, for sure, dudes and dudettes. Radical. He actually fired at two support beams that precisely fall down into an arch. Not to topple the cranes on the enemy, but give himself something to swing from as he grabbed Leanne, suddenly not in her little bubble for some reason. And having timed things right, Cyborg and Beast Boy have arrived, having been called before Roy left to help Donna and Starfire. He mentions Vic was paralyzed while the dome was up, which fits for this two-parter, but not the new Teen Titans tie-in, and apparently Beast Boy was stuck in pigeon form this whole time, so both of them have some pent-up aggression to unleash. I would have figured that the loss of the shape-shifting powers would have simply reverted him to base human, maybe even without the green coloring. But as I just mentioned, the consistency of how the dome restricts superheroes is kind of in question. Roy confirms this is indeed his daughter, since she doesn't like being called Pumpkin, and though he doesn't like leaving his friends behind, he prioritizes getting his kid to safety. Taking her to the shelter, he says he'll tell her why her name is on the plaque later, and says to everyone else they need to evacuate to the west while he secures Leanne in his bunker. Okay, good. Hey, um... Can any of us non-powered people stay in the nice, safe bunker, too? Oh, no, okay, that's fine. We'll just run in a maddening crowd. That's cool. Try not to trample each other. From Leanne's perspective, her father dropped her off at daycare earlier that morning and was abducted by Firehead a short time later. But for Roy, it's just a blessing to see his child alive again, though he's conflicted between staying with her and helping the Titans. Naturally, Doom Slayer pops in, maybe he should change his name to Moment Slayer, and claims that in this fight initiated by some unknown entity, Leanne is the weapon of victory. When the girl disappears, Arsenal fires at the villain, demanding her return. But Dream Slayer, portaling the shots with his cloak, I guess, says he doesn't simply want to win the battle, but Arsenal's soul. Tech nabbit, you see, Joe Casada? This is the kind of nonsense you influence, even outside your own publisher. The Titans, meanwhile, focus all their attacks on Lord Havoc, but the guy has destroyed planets and just knocks them away. Beastie suggests calling in the other Gotham heroes, but 
His lordship says they're busy battling elsewhere for their city. Not sure how he knows that or why he'd care, though. Unless this is a case like in Superboy, where they're trying to root out their captor instead of playing his game, but it's not specified. Havoc's blast destroys part of the century-old Sprang Bridge, watched by Arsenal and Doomslayer from the bunker, the latter of whom says that aiding in his friend's defeat is the right choice, on top of retrieving his daughter from Limbo. But Roy wonders what the point of the bargain is if the extremists are going to win anyway. Somehow knowing the secrets of Harper's Lair, he coaxes the archer to press a button concealed in the armrest of his chair, near a photo of Leanne. He presses it, though with some hesitation, and it activates cannons he'd installed all over the city. And only by unleashing his rage, Dreamslayer claims, can he purge his sins. A cannon hits Starfire, and Leanne is returned only briefly at first. But as the other titans are targeted, Roy demands she be brought back to him before finishing the job. And that's exactly what Slayer does. Even though he just said he'd only do it after he defeated his friends. But okay, changed his mind for no reason, I guess. Hibachi Face is delighted enough at the betrayal of one's soul, and as Leanne runs to her father's arms, Roy initiates secondary target locks, and the weapons prove more effective on the extremists than the Titans did. Somehow. Then he hits Dime Store Dormammu with an EMP, which fries the bunker, the electronic arm he's wearing, and also scrambles the villain's teleportation, sending him back with his team, which he's quick to teleport elsewhere to face the Titans without the city's defenses to aid them. The heroes regroup on a rooftop, meeting the reunited father and daughter, apparently no apology necessary from Roy for shooting Starfire in the back, like a big, fat, cyber-armed rat. The peace doesn't last long, as an explosion erupts from Robinson Park, which has no weapons systems. Why not? How else are you going to keep those pesky kids from cheating at kickball? The Titans intend to face them again, win or die trying, but Arsenal is staying with his child. Forever or five minutes, it's miraculous enough she's back at all, Donna says. The comic ends with Roy holding Leanne as the Titans take off to face impossible odds, and he's thankful for everything they gave him over the years. Their family, friendship, the want to be a better man, and now this time with his daughter. So that was Convergence, the Titans. I picked this up because I got to liking Fabian Nisiza's run on Red Robin before the big flashpoint mistake of 2011. But I couldn't get into the new 52 title Legion Lost, which he wrote, because I found myself not really caring about the characters. Here, he's writing a character I'm only mildly more familiar with, and... I'm enjoying myself a bit more, but that doesn't make it a perfect story. Even if you ignore the inconsistencies regarding cybernetics with the new Teen Titans tie-in, there's another oddity. What makes Roy's arm, or 80% of Cyborg's body, different from any other electronic device used frequently in this story, or any other, that they'd be rendered inert by the dome? If Psy was paralyzed, does that mean his power cells weren't working? Was he on conveniently operational life support machines? And a smaller detail was how Roy's arm cannons were pointed straight at Donna and Starfire, but all of a sudden looked like they were arched upwards to take out those beams. That's just... wonky. Yeah. Aim? No! <laughs> And then we have Dream Slayer, who is as much a stranger to me as the rest of the extremists, and for all his power, which seems almost convenient, but maybe it's part of his standard set, he suddenly becomes a moron. He orders Roy to defeat his friends, or he won't see his daughter ever again. Then Roy says he won't defeat his friends before he gets his daughter back. And this villain who talks about betraying your true self and how to cleanse your sins, he acquiesces and gets close enough to the guy he's trying to trick that he can be disposed of. Heck of a time for a brain fart. Though for him, I think that might have caused a small explosion, so I guess he's just an idiot. Though the art overall is smooth, bright, and clean, denoting the overall uplifting nature of a usually crime-ridden city finding peace, and Roy getting a happy ending. Like I said, I don't know much about Arsenal or his family, 
but Leanne's death in Cry for Justice was completely unnecessary. An attempt to shock readers into getting interested in Harper as a character. And even in this one alternate reality, it's nice to see it undone. And while I wouldn't call this Nasisa's best work, it probably isn't his worst. It's a good enough story that's told with a few hiccups and one pretty noticeable convenience. Though, take this for what you will, I'm not close enough to the characters involved to be too heavily offended by any mischaracterizations you might see. I'm the Angry Spork, and man, have I got issues. Mm -hmm.